podcast. We demystify what goes on behind the therapy room door. Join us on this voyage of discovery and co-creative conversations. This is The Therapy Show, Behind Closed Doors podcast with Bob Cook and Jackie Jones. Welcome back to part two of um, The Narcissistic Client. And this part two bit is going to be about how we work with somebody um, that is narcissistic or has narcissistic tendencies in the therapy room. I'm Jackie Jones, and I'm going to introduce you to the wonderful Bob Cook. Hello. Hello. With with all his words of wisdom about how we would work with a person with narcissistic tendencies or personality traits in the therapy room, yeah. or the disorder even. Yeah, either way. And uh, and we talked last podcast about the features of a narcissist and how we can spot a narcissist, uh, the profile of a narcissist. So let's work a little bit now. We'll talk a little bit now on how you would work with them from that framework so in some ways this bit i'm going to talk about is the same as any disorder or person we work with you have to find a way to create a environment where they feel attuned and they feel understood now or somebody who has to be special have a sense of entitlement and all the things we've talked about in the last podcast then maybe this is a bit more uh challenging however we need to be find a way to do this and the best way i know to do this way is to use your own sense of empathy and, a, and your own sense of attuning uh to the her child so you need to create um a environment uh where using empathy you can get to their child so in other words we could use empathic transactions from the ta world um, or we could from any other psychotherapy world we want to pick use sense of empathy to get to that now last podcast i told i was talking about an example of eleanor greenberg when she was actually explaining um that this process of a a client of hers who had a you know a rant and rave in the session because he just had a hamburger and the waitress had given mustard instead of um tomato sauce and he had ranted and raved at her and wanted to get her sacked and when he came to the therapeutic room with Eleanor Greenberg he ranted and raved at her and demanded that she go down next door and make sure that the waitress was sacked. Yeah. So how do you treat that? So the best way to treat this is to decenter from the waitress and use empathic attunement or empathic transactions to, um, you know, uh, actually uh, inquire about how the narcissistic client felt in terms of did they feel shamed or humiliated or slighted or discounted and in that way the client will feel understood and safe and then you'll be able to work with what were the real injuries which of course existed 20 or 30 years ago whatever it is not worth what the waiter said or did or did not do yeah yeah so the first step is use empathy or empathic transactions to to get alongside the clients so they feel understood and soothed and most important safe <clears throat> yeah so you you were talking in the in the last one about um us needing to be perfect and us you know the the, the client might idealize the the therapist that that's really interesting <laughs> because you you also spoke about them needing to be top dog them needing to be you know the status and all that sort of stuff so do we 
kind of get that status from them through empathy because yeah. it's kind of like we're on their side where we understand completely yeah. how you would have felt so it that's yeah. how we make that connection right yeah right. because no one in their life has really understood them before yeah so you'll have to be very super very special if you can actually be one of the few people in the world who could understand how hurt shamed devalued discounted you actually feel yeah so and, and we're not talking big life events here what that lady was describing was a burger with mustard and not tomato yeah, sauce yeah. but that yeah. can cut yeah. them to the core that yeah yeah absolutely another example with somebody who's narcissistic who i took on and quite high on the continuum i would say uh about the third or fourth sessions on maybe five actually i thought i was doing quite well so i think it was perhaps five um and they've been talking about their world and everything else and xxxx and um i made a very big mistake i started to identify and i thought i'd used my own sense of self to come alongside the child in the sense of mutuality i walked the same path however with a narcissist that is a big mistake or can be a big mistake so when i said something like it's 20 odd years ago i stand on my exact transactions but i said something like you know I, I can understand that because you know i felt the same way in xxs in the service of mutuality yeah i remember this what i'm going to say jackie as as it was yesterday and i'm sure it's 25 years ago so the person suddenly stood up and bellowed at me for a good, and it's a long time in the therapy session, this 10 minutes about therapy isn't about my feelings, it's about his. Wow. <laughs> and I was very surprised that he didn't walk straight outside the door and leave. I don't remember it's such a long time how I got him back, but I, I must have got him back by by either apologizing um or some empathic transactions which talked about how he felt when i talked about my feelings instead of asking him about his feelings yeah yeah easy mistake because if you think about relational needs and you think about the rela unmet relational need for mutuality you might aim for that but with a narcissist it's a dangerous road that so I learned, somebody who's narcissistic trains, I don't share my sense of self because you actually, well, not at the beginning. I think you can do it later on in therapy, but certainly not at the beginning stage of therapy when they don't know you at all. They will only feel safe and secure if they feel that you're inquiring about their frame of reference and not yours. Yeah, yeah. And they are special and unique. So if you're using that mutuality to try and make a connection, then they're not that special if you've experienced something similar to them. Yeah, and probably shamed. Yeah, yeah. I would suspect that shame was the biggest uh, feeling they had. And, uh, and there's a lot written about um, shame when you talk about narcissistic injury. There's many books you would find, many articles in the literature about shame being the deepest uh, injury for the narcissistic client, where they felt shamed, belittled, humiliated by the slightest remark you might make. So if, if we talk about where this develops, you know, how, how it starts, the, the hurt child, it's quite normal for, well, we do all go through a phase of, you know, the world does centre around us when yeah. we're young. Yeah, oh, one, at the age of one, yeah. we have a sense of armed potus. I, again, I remember my daughter coming in at the age of one to my bedroom and said, Daddy, I'm here! In the most <laughs> omnipotent way possible. So at the age of one, we, we you know, it's very normal to have that level of omnipotence. And it's not until they reach the age of between one and a half or perhaps a bit later to three and a half, where they go into a whole 
the Potchma stage around separating and individuating, which is another story altogether. But in those early stages of life, nine months a year, um, that sense of omnipotence is, I think, a general stage of child development. Yeah, yeah. And um, in order to, to have that, you know, separating out and individuation and reproachment and everything. Am I right in thinking that we need to, this is going to sound awful, I don't even know how to say it, hurt our child's ego to a certain extent so that they move out of that? Boundaries. Yeah, that they don't get everything that they want. I'm not saying that we Boundaries. hurt them, but we will ultimately hurt their feelings because they won't get everything they want when they want it and we will put structure and boundaries in place and limits around instant gratification yeah yeah which is going to hurt the child because all kids want what they want when they want it well it's a strong word hurt but i'll go with that but my I'll, my grandson looks very hurt if he doesn't I get what he wants when he hurt. wants it i would say healthy hurtness yeah, oh yes, yeah. I'm not talking physical hurt, but his feelings get hurt if he, yeah, you know, yeah. when he says to me, Nanny, do this yeah. now, and I yeah. say I can't, I'm busy, he yeah. looks hurt. Yeah. yeah. But the worst thing is if you didn't do that. But that's that's kind of what I mean. So it is healthy hurt. It is letting them know that unfortunately they are not the center of everybody's universe. <laughs> yeah. And I think I think that comes later in the developmental spectrum about one and a half to two the te this is why they call that area the terrible twos yeah because what happens is the child goes into a huge and not i'm not going to say it's a narcissistic fit but you, i was thinking of my client who stood up and bellowed at me about the fact that i hadn't actually uh asked questions enough about how he felt and i was daring to talk about how he felt and i was thinking of jessica at the age of two who um, had a had a real sort of bellowing, ranting, raving session at a two-year-old because she was in Tesco's and wanted to go this way instead of that way. Yeah. Yeah. So it's a, it's a normal part of, of development for children to be narcissistic, particularly, yeah, like you yeah, said, yeah, yeah, terrible twos and troublesome threes. Yeah. 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 And, you know, healthily, we need to set those structures and those boundaries and those so that's and they will feel safer then yes yeah yeah because that scared child if they get what they want when they want mm. it kind of puts them in charge of the situation somehow which that's right the problem though is um <clears throat> if the child and they have to do this starts testing their own sense of self-definition and testing their own abilities and start individuating in those early developmental milestones and the parent does not validate that and doesn't allow them to get the sugar first or whatever it is they go and get the sugar for them or whatever ever ever example we put then what happens is they may feel shamed hurt yeah. humiliated misunderstood yeah because they're not allowed to test their own power themselves. Yeah. Which it's important that, that kids do stamp the foot down, but it's it's about, you know, them understanding that the parent is doing what they're doing in order to keep them safe and you know that they there are structure and boundaries in place within the family unit. I think yeah. for a child to feel in control at a young age is so scary for them. Somebody has to meet them at that level. Absolutely. So I, I couldn't agree more. The problem, as I said before, is if the parent doesn't allow them to test their own power. Yeah. Now that, and at the same time, have the structure and safety for them to be able to do that. Yeah yeah so that you, you when i have spoke to people around you know when they they want to know about the narcissist and i say that you know that's when it's it starts to be formed and what you were saying about being empathic and them not having you know a robust sense of self and 
that empty core, it puts a different slant on it. You know, Definitely. people give narcissists a really bad press, and I'm not saying, you know, that it's nice to be on the receiving end of a narcissist, but when you look at how they present and the reasons why, it is okay to be empathic towards them. Yeah, it's more than okay to be empathic. and In fact, the whole self-psychology movement led by Kurt in the early 1960s in the treatment of narcissism talked about the empathic attunement being the way forward. And yeah. without that, um, the treatment of narcissism won't happen. Yeah. Having said that, I don't know whether it's appropriate for you know, us to talk about in, in this session about protecting the other person in a relationship with a narcissist. You you need to protect yourself in that relationship as well. I think that's a completely different podcast. Yeah, that's yeah. taking us outside the clinical room. Yeah. I could even look at how come somebody would have a relation with somebody who's narcissistic at that level and in terms of protection and look at what's the... Um, sort of scripts that collide that makes uh, somebody go out with the narcissist you know we could look at a schizoid or a subservient personality we could do many things but it's really outside the remit of this podcast it's an interesting podcast to have by the way to yeah. look at you know what types of scripts collide i think i'm i'm just aware of the listener that you know if there is somebody that's listening to this particular podcast because it is around narcissistic personalities just to bear in mind the other person that potentially could be in a relationship with them when I'm talking about being empathic towards them and those sort of things I don't want to discount anybody else no so I'll say something to those people number one you're not their therapist yeah number two um, you can't meet the needs of somebody at 25 or 30 or whatever it is um, when actually the injury is 20 years ago in other words whatever you do won't make any difference in that sense yeah. what you need to do is set the boundaries and um, be protective of your own self now that might mean not being in relationship with somebody or if you feel that you can uh, have the type of relationship of uh, a high level of empathy and creating that type of environment but you know you're not the therapist no you know this is two humans hopefully meeting from two adult positions if that's not possible then you need to start thinking about whether you need to be in a relationship whether can, whether the relationship is unhealthy and what makes up a healthy relationship and it, i tell you what doesn't make up an unhealthy uh, healthy relationship is where you have the continuation of a parent child script instead of the ability to have two adult to adult uh, conversations. Yeah, yeah. I just thought it was worth mentioning. No, it's a very uh, important one. You know, taking on board who potentially could be listening to this. Yeah, no, you shouldn't be in a relationship with somebody who is a full-blown narcissist and, uh, and is creating a situation which is abusive for you. You need to find a way somehow to set the boundaries and create a, a protective environment for yourself um, but I think also for the people listening to this uh, you know there is a continuum of narcissistic traits yeah to narcissistic disorders yeah and they're two different things somebody with narcissistic traits probably might have enough adult or accessibility to them for enough adult um for them to go to therapy or deal with the things they need to deal with so they're in a better relationship somebody in narcissistic personality disorder will never have that no so the, the clients that you have worked with in the therapy room how how did it end <laughs> right okay Let's deal with narcissistic personalities because I have dealt with people up with high continuum. They are usually in therapy if they stay and we work with the child and get to the child and the, or the false self for five to six to seven, eight years every week. 
So it's long-term psychotherapy. Yes. Yeah. That's, that, that's that side, high-function yeah. narcissists. Yeah. Narcissistic traits where they have, um, people have issues of uh, maintaining an adult relationship, for example, or they um, aren't able to account for the other, or they have impaired empathy at a sort of minor level, if I want to use that language. Then um, it's also, they don't have to be in therapy necessarily five to 10 years or something, might be only therapy for a year or might be even six months, but you can still work in a way where you can get to the child because the therapy is with the child ego state, not in the here and now. Yeah. But because they have more accessibility to their adult, they're more able to be in a therapeutic relationship with you where they can look at their relationship, where they have some access to empathy. But you see the number one position, Jackie, at this level is that they haven't got empathy because they haven't got empathy for themselves. Yeah. So if you can get to a place where they can start seeing themselves as uh, needing help, get to a place where they see themselves in a compassionate way, where you start to teach them what is a self-caring position in a relationship, they will, they will then have empathy for the other. Yeah. Now that is more, that goal is reachable at this level of what I'm going to say, a neurotic narcissism, if you like, rather than this personality disorder level, which is far more challenging. But at the level of the neurotic narcissist, if you want, then it is more achievable. But they will need to come to therapy to do it. Yeah. And sometimes that being in a relationship and, and realising that things aren't going that well can be the catalyst for them to go to therapy. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. So on this list of things to do, um, the, the, I know this may be a technical term for people listening, but through the what I call idealising transference, which has come from the empathy and the environment of an empathic tuned therapy where they can start to idealize you and see you as somebody that's on their side, understands them for the first time. Uh, they're able to start talking about their narcissistic fault self, if you want to put it that way. Um, as that idealizing transfer starts to um, evolve, they start to feel protected by the therapist. They will then start maybe to allow you to see their in their depression, uh, uh, despair, the inadequacy, and what's beneath the grandiose defense. But they have to be able to see you at least as special as them, or even more so. Yeah. Yeah, which... It kind of links in, I suppose, to what you, you said earlier um, about coming alongside them and trying to do that mutual thing, you know, that to allow for them to allow us to be on the same level status wise as them. Yeah. Yeah. They need to idealize you to do that. Yeah. Yeah. And that takes time. It takes time for that transference to evolve. Yeah. What, what sort of games go on in the therapy room with them? Well, G Professor might be one where they are more wonderful than you or um, it will be I'm OK. And you, they attempt to uh, devalue the therapist. Put the therapist down and attack the therapist. Now, if the therapist can withstand that, and through empathy and empathic transactions to get what's underneath that, then they're on to a winner. Yeah. And then hopefully move to what I would call the recognition stage, which you start to, some people might call this through educative therapy, but you start to help them recognize 
that their narcissistic behavior actually doesn't help them in relationships. Yeah. Now, you're only going to get there if they're going to, if through the idolizing transference, they're going to allow you to, you know, touch their false sense of self and all the things I've just talked about. And then you can start, you know, teaching them if you want to look at it this way, I like it in a way, because you can start um, helping them recognize that the narcissistic behavior pushes people away rather than helps them have any sense of intimacy. I think, I think in that stage also, they need to start to find compassion and compassion for themselves. Yeah because then they can give it to other people. Yeah. I, I, again, I, I don't know why, but as you were saying that, it's kind of like separating out the behavior from them. You know, the, the, how they yeah. hold people at bay doesn't necessarily define who they are as a person. It, you know, if they understand that it's a protection, it's, you know. Yeah, you're right. And, and it's at this stage where, that they may decide to leave therapy. I think most they're very highly likely to leave therapy if they don't if they haven't got the motivation to go further. Yeah. Because the next stage, of course, is is helping them um, making changes in their relationship and in life. But if they don't want to recognise it in the first place, or they haven't got the motivation, yeah. See, I, I think really, Jackie, until they start really having self-care for themselves and compassion for themselves and empathy for themselves, they'll find it difficult to have empathy for other people. Yeah. So there has to be a lot of work on uh, finding their, com them compassion for themselves, finding kindness for themselves, uh, teaching them what that is, helping them look at self-care because once they do that, they are then more able to be able to do it to other people. And if they can do it to other people, then you're going to have more success in, let's call it the recognition stage, if you like. And then you could be able to judge how much motivation they have to going on to be able to make the changes they need to make Yeah. in therapy. Now, this is uh, long-term therapy. Yeah, yeah. Because when you're talking about self-care and, you know, compassion for themselves and everything, there's, there's something around, in order to do that, you need to be vulnerable and realise that you're not superhuman, that you're not, you know, impenetrable. If, if we're going to be compassionate and empathic towards ourselves, that shows a certain amount of vulnerability, which goes against yeah. the narcissistic stuff. So I can well, see why yeah. that's kind of backwards and forwards in yeah yeah that's what that's this is where they may leave therapy yeah yeah and i often would yeah you remember i said earlier perhaps i hope it was in this podcast but it might have been the other one where the challenge is that they have to see humans as normal and more normal and mortal yeah and make and mistakes, mistakes yeah. doesn't yeah. mean that the world's going to end yeah and it may take a very, very long time in this particular stage for, for them to come to the acceptance that it's okay to make mistakes. And in fact, a degree of norm normality is normal. Mm. And that, you know, they don't have to be special. They don't have to X, 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 X. But the problem is, and yeah, you're right again, is that you're touching on their grandiosity defense or their you know, I call God defense or Eleanor Greenberg did anyway, that grandiose, omnipotent defense. So it's like, hopefully you have done enough therapy by them to enable them to perhaps have enough motivation or be able to see um, some of the changes they need to make. And one of them is exactly what you're talking about, is see their, you know, sharing their vulnerability as a strength and not a weakness. Yeah. Would you use humour in a therapy room with a narcissist? Oh, wonderful. You would definitely the passive aggressive, uh, which podcast we were talking about passive aggressive, you use humour a lot. Probably not so much. Okay. 
And the reason for that is they may think you're laughing at them and then feel shame. Do you remember why I said it's really one of their features of a narcissist that they will take the slightest criticism or the slightest the slur to yeah, yeah. as maybe humiliation and shame and all those sort of things. And humor is one of those areas where I think somebody who's got a very, very, very sensitive psychic skin may not see humor as humor. So I don't tend to use humor much with somebody. Now, as, as they work through this and all the things that we're talking about have more accessible to adult, then that's a different story. But I think it's something to, to, to be aware of is that they, any perceived, you know, criticism or slight, and they could see humor that way, I think. Yeah. Interesting. So it's something to consider clinically. Yeah. As you work through it, and they're more able to have access to the here and now rather than a, a regressed child ego state, then you're more able to test that out. In fact, the more I'm thinking, it's probably a good test of how far you come in therapy that they can take your humour without feeling completely annihilated and shamed and humiliated would be a good criteria of how far you've come yeah but huge but often they're very very serious characters yeah I, th I think that that's what i was thinking because i i do use humor quite a lot in the therapy room I, more more that i'm quite open about my I don't know, is it failty? Is that the right word? Do you know what I mean? That I make mistakes. Mm. To get to that stage of the narcissist is a long time. Now, again, if you think of the continuum and the, you know, narcissist traits rather than the personality disorder, you'll probably get there quicker. Yeah. But where you will need to go is to what Greenberg calls, especially with a full-blown narcissist, calls the, called after the recognition stage, called the lost paradise stage. In other words, for them to for them to get on in relationships and not push people away and not tap them and not all the things we've just talked about, exploit them. And I've talked about they have to find compassion for themselves and all those sorts of things. But they also need to get also what will happen is they start to change their narcissistic defenses or coping mechanisms they're more likely of course to go to a place where they get in touch with what they've lost because you see if you've got a grandiose omnipotent defense system where everything is you're so special and all the things we're talking about world is so wonderful because you're so wonderful and you're so perfect and xxx and you can control it and da 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 that might seem from that position almost like a paradise yeah but of course once you start giving those narcissist defense and, and go through the recognition stage that i talked about then you have to start getting in touch with the lost paradise yeah so a sense of grieving and loss around yeah that yeah yeah and also getting in touch with the painful memories of their unhappy family life you know so of course you know once you get touching on what wasn't and how they were they were actually misunderstood and actually how they were shamed maybe um that's hard stuff for them to get hold of yeah yeah so we could do more episodes on this, Bob. We could do a whole month on narcissistic people. Yeah, because to get to that stage, you often don't often get there, by the way, because then they have to move on to what we call the self-activation stage, which is actually integrating a lot of the new coping mechanisms and ways of being. So, for example, the very simple level, and again, I've lost track of this was in the last podcast of this podcast, that if they take somebody out, that they actually can listen to them for half the conversation and ask them about, you know, how are you getting on? What's it been like? What do you do? What's your favorite food? Have you had other relationships and all those sorts of things? If they can actually do that, which is what I call the self-activation phase, 
and, and changing their narcissistic coping mechanisms, then they're on the way to cure. Yeah. You saw it on, I talked about Love Island, on, I thought it was on the other podcast, but I like watching these reality TV programs away because I like the psychological aspect of all. Now, one of these alpha males, and I'm sure has been narcissistic traits, just talked about himself all the time and very rarely talks about how the other person is. And one of the women started to complain about the fact that this person never talks about anything about themselves and never asks them about how they're getting on or how they're feeling. And that is the complaint of somebody who's around a narcissist. That they're not seen. Yeah. Not ever talked about because the other person's always talking about themselves. Which in a relationship is not very good. <laughs> no, the narcissist is to get to that place and understand that and recognize that and change their patterns so they can actually do the a very different normal what would be seen by so many people as normal yeah. way of communicating is actually a massive leap yeah yeah so bob we need to end i as you say jackie I could go on talking, but I hope the two podcasts, this one and the one before, have been useful and uh, helpful. Yeah, and it's worth maybe mentioning that if anybody does want us to to talk more on this topic, that they can get in touch and message us, and we're quite happy to to talk about lots of things. Yeah, because I can. I, I realise there's co- uh, there's places for comments and questions uh, on on the. Uh, on the videos i mean if on the youtube videos of the podcasts yeah which i said i i must make sure i answer but um we happily talk about that uh or if people want another podcast about uh the reaction to this one for yes 100 percent. another one we could do because we're here to answer people's questions Absolutely. So as well as talk one. about the stuff that we like talking about. So what are we going to do next time, Bob? Well, are we going to this, do the, the histrionic? The yeah, right. that's where people get confused with narcissistic traits and histrionic traits. And actually, even those are similarities, there's great differences. Yeah. Right. Okie dokie. Until the next time, Bob. I'll give you a quick sign. I want one minute just to say, <laughs> just show you the difference in the treatment. So, for example... With a histrionic client, the best way, the best way to come alongside somebody who's histrionic and will present with feelings is to ask them feeling queries. Yes. If you did that with somebody who's narcissistic, they would feel shamed, humiliated and devalued and probably never come back. See you next week. See you next week. (laughs) (laughs) Bye. Yeah, bye-bye. You've been listening to The Therapy Show Behind Closed Doors Podcast We hope you enjoyed the show Don't forget to subscribe And leave us a review We'll be back next week With another episode